Is the Rajapaksa political dynasty in Sri Lanka about to end? President Gotabaya Rajapaksa is under pressure to resign after his brother Mahinda stepped down as Prime Minister. But that wasn't enough to calm violent protests. So where does Sri Lanka go from here? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now for months, protesters have been chanting go home at Sri Lanka's most powerful political family. President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and his brother, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa, are accused of corruption and mismanaging the economy. Mahinda's resignation on Monday failed to quell public anger. At least seven people were killed, more than 200 injured, after Rajapaksa supporters fought with anti-government protesters. Police and security personnel fired tear gas, water cannon. Demonstrators tried to storm the Prime Minister's residence and set fire to properties owned by the Rajapaksa family and government ministers. The President has given the military and police even more powers to detain people without warrants. Shortages of fuel, food and medicine brought thousands out onto the streets in protests that had been mostly peaceful until this week. Manal Fernandez has more now from the capital, Colombo. Calm restored more or less in most parts of the country as the curfew extended. Now, obviously helped by a big presence of the three armed forces supporting the police. Uh, we had members of the army, the air force, uh, the navy stopping us at different points, checking us as to where we were going because obviously there's a curfew in Sri Lanka till Wednesday morning. Uh, many people don't seem to be heeding the curfew in terms of even you can see some of the scenes behind me, those burnt out wreckages. There are four buses uh, and this was the scene right throughout many parts of Colombo, close to the Prime Minister's official residence, which is just down the road. Obviously, these were the buses that brought in many of the supporters of the Prime Minister uh, that subsequently marched on the protesters who are demanding the resignations of the Rajapaksa brothers and their government. Uh, but when they tried to go back uh, to their homes, to their villages, uh, they had their just desserts. The protesters say they were giving uh, these supporters a taste of their own medicine, that they were absolutely fed up of intimidation and strong arm tactics that the Rajapaksas have been employing for a long, long time. Now, internationally, there's been condemnation of the violence. We've heard that the uh, Commissioner of Human Rights, Michel Bachelet in Geneva, has condemned the violence asking for a proper investigation into what sparked the violence and these incidents. For the protesters themselves, the fact that the Prime Minister has resigned does not go far enough. Their rallying cry for this campaign was go to go home uh, and they did specify and continue to stand by the fact they want a clean sweep. So the President, the government, they all need to go in order for the protesters to be appeased. Minel Fernandez, Inside Story. Well, Sri Lanka's economic crisis has been brewing since 2019, when the government started dipping into foreign reserves to pay its debt. Revenues dropped in 2020 when exports fell, after the pandemic also ground the tourism industry there to a halt. And agricultural output suffered last year, when the government banned fertilizers and ordered farmers to go organic. By March, the situation was dire. Sri Lanka couldn't pay for imports of food, medicine, fuel, People faced power cuts lasting up to 13 hours a day. The government tried to contain discontent by shutting down social media and declaring a state of emergency. But protests grew. And in early April, Sri Lanka's entire cabinet resigned. Well, let's now bring in our guests. Joining us from Colombo is Harsha de Silva. He's a member of Sri Lanka's parliament in the main opposition party. We also have Ganeshan Wignaraja. He's a senior research associate at the Overseas Development Institute. He joins us from London. And also joining us from the Sri Lankan capital is Bhavani Fonseca. She's a senior researcher and attorney at law with the Center for Policy Alternatives. A very warm welcome to each of you. Thank you for your time on our program. I want to ask, because we've been seeing these protests continue now for weeks, months. They've been mostly peaceful. Bhavani, I know you've been out on the streets. What do you think has triggered this level of violence that we've seen? So thank you for having me. And it's a timely discussion considering what's happening in Sri Lanka. 
The protest, as you said, has been rather peaceful in the last two months. We commenced the um, protests in the suburbs of Colombo in early March, and it's spread across Sri Lanka with a large protest in the center of Colombo, and it has been peaceful all this time. What happened yesterday was when the protesters were outside the official residence of the prime minister, there were goons associated with the government who went and attacked the peaceful protesters and continued to uh, travel to the other side, which was the larger side. And that's where also some violence happened. So really peaceful protests by citizens for two months. And the violence really needs to be directly attributed to the prime minister and the government, because so far we did not see any violence coming from the protesters till yesterday. Well, I understand there was some sort of meeting with the pro-government protesters ahead of the violence that some ministers were also present calling for action of some sort. Now, we've obviously seen homes and offices torched. Does that mean the government side is backing down or, or Hasha, do you think we'll see further confrontations? Well, I actually hope not because it has completely gotten out of control uh, and uh, there is no government, there is no prime minister, there is no cabinet. Um, and I don't know whether the police are able to act. Uh, we haven't seen the president, he's holed up somewhere. Um, so things are very, very dicey right now. Uh, so to get the country back to some sense of uh, normalcy, uh, we need to urgently have a government in place um, so that the law enforcement officers can control these mobs uh, because otherwise they could go berserk. Well, this is all obviously taking place within the context of this very dire economic crisis that we've been talking about. I see a former finance minister warned that some of Gotabaya Rajapaksa's policies, especially those sweeping tax cuts that we've previously covered on this show, would send the country bankrupt. But it seems like this level of profound anger that we're seeing goes beyond that. There's this sense of betrayal. Uh, Ganeshan, where do you think that's coming from? So essentially, the crisis is a function of both the pandemic, which left deep scarring on the Sri Lankan economy, growth slipped to minus 3.6% in 2020, and policy missteps by the government. And the policy missteps do include, indeed, the tax cut of uh, 2019, which uh, lost revenue of about 2% uh, of uh, GDP, but also printing money, which led to hyperinflation, which we face today. Uh, inflation on a year-on-year -year basis to April is about 30 percent, and food inflation is running at uh, practically 50 percent. And then you've had uh, this rapid switch from uh, chemical fertilizers to organic fertilizers, which, uh, without preparing farmers, which has radically affected agriculture. So this combination of external events and policy missteps are leading us to where we are. The only other point I want to add to this is that a communication by the government was very poor and people were not prepared for this dire situation we were in. Uh, we were told that there were these non-conventional policies that were being done which would save the country, but this has proved to be uh, totally wrong. Well, given that the resignation we saw of the prime minister who enacted a lot of these policies, it seems to have done very little to appease the protesters. Many are now asking if this is actually going to be the end of the Rajapaksa era. Now, just to remind our viewers, the Rajapaksas have been one of Sri Lanka's most powerful political families since the 1930s. Mahinda Rajapaksa first became president in 2005, and he soon appointed his younger brother, Gotabaya, as defense secretary and placed other family members in senior political positions. Four years later, Mahinda gained praise for ending the civil war against the Tamil Tigers. But... He was also accused of violating human rights and crushing dissent. Gotabaya himself then won the presidency in 2019. He then appointed his brother, Mahinda, prime minister a year later. Two other Rajapaksa family members were also appointed ministers. Many others also hold senior positions. It's believed that the brothers controlled up to 70% of Sri Lanka's budget at one point. Now, the family denies this and has repeatedly rejected allegations of nepotism. I see, though, that there are a number of other Rajapaksas who've been in ministerial or other senior positions who've now been removed. 
Uh, Basil Rajapaksa, the finance minister accused of corruption. Chamal Rajapaksa, minister of irrigation. His son, Shasindra, who led that whole fertilizer ban, also gone. Mahinda's son, Namal, also at one point minister of youth and sports. He said, the family is now going through a bad patch. Harsha, is it more than that, more than a bad patch? Well, yes, I mean, that's putting it mildly. Uh, the situation in the, the Treasury and the Central Bank um, is nothing to, uh, you know, be happy about. Uh, we are in um, serious trouble. Uh, we need um, uh, some sort of bridge financing uh, to make sure that we have uh, sufficient um, uh, fuel, uh, LP gas, coal, uh, and without uh, the coffers sufficiently filled to purchase these items, uh, we have long power cuts, uh, we have long lines of fuel and so on. So the situation is pretty bad. Uh, we need to really be able to quickly uh, put a plan uh, uh, in action uh, to be able to uh, deal with the, the situation. So it's more than a bad patch. It's a pretty terrible situation. Well, looking at the leadership specifically, I wonder, is there more at stake here for the Rajapaksas than simply staying in power? I know, given there have been allegations of human rights abuses, war crimes from the Tamil Tiger crackdown, could the brothers then be concerned about some kind of accountability for that? Bhavani, I, I want to point out here, Mahinda's already been refusing probes, still hasn't been a proper investigation. Uh, do you think that that's well, bleeding into this? I think there's a combination, but definitely there are serious allegations against particular individuals in the family. And this is both on corruption issues as well as what's happened in the past during the war as well as post-war. So it's very serious allegations, which has now gone to the UN and there are also cases in other jurisdiction. So there is a fear that if they lose power, that these cases can come back to haunt them. Um, now, we're also seeing what we saw yesterday in terms of the violence and coming back to what the protesters faced. We need to recognize that the violence started from the president's res uh, prime minister's residence. And there's footage to show that there were not just the prime minister and his son, but there were other ministers. So there needs to be an independent investigation whether particularly individuals in the family as well as the former cabinet, and I say former because we don't now have a government, are responsible for incitement and organizing some of this violence. So there are serious allegations against many, not just the Rajapaksa family, but those around them as well. And the question is, can there be accountability for all of them? This in a context where there were serious cases that were brought against them in 2015 onwards, and those cases didn't proceed. So lots of questions whether accountability can happen in the present setup, but there are lots of allegations, and I fear that they're holding on to power because they're preventing those cases from moving forward. Uh, but there is also, by my understanding, an ethnic dimension here that I think is potentially quite telling. So the Rajapaksas had always banked on their support from the Sinhalese Buddhist community, majority, 75% of the population. But we've also seen them join these protests in, in fairly huge numbers. Uh, Ganeshan, do you think that that's pushing towards political change here? So in a context of a post-conflict society like ours, one had hoped that when the Rajapaksas had concluded the civil conflict in 2009, there would be an attempt to heal the wounds, as you have had in South Africa, in Ireland, and in other places which have been conflict-driven. Sadly, that had not proved to be the case. And if anything, there was an element of triumphalism. And what is very interesting with the current protest, at least as I observe it, is that you've had multi-ethnic uh, protests coming around. And I think this is an interesting and unforeseen development in our society and hopefully a positive step. And we certainly need, uh, if we are going to prosper and grow, uh, we will need to heal the wounds of a long conflict and the ethnic divisions that we have had, because no country can really 
develop and grow very fast if they are ethnically divided um, and have these perpetual bouts of instability, as we have sadly seen. So we have to rethink a lot of what we have done in the past and introduce uh, proper policy measures and provide a proper rule of law if we want to move forward. I was trying to gauge public opinion around all of this, and I was looking at some surveys. I see Gallup put confidence in the government at record lows, heading downward at the end of last year. Another poll, the approval rating for the government was 10% back in January. Um, Harshan, how much support, you're sitting in the opposition, I'm curious, how much support does the government have, do you think? And, and what are the demographics here that make up the bulk of that support ongoing? Well, I don't think the government has any support any longer. I mean, yesterday was uh, uh, absolutely turning point uh, because the government, uh, it was all for everyone to see, uh, called up goons and thugs to the, the official residence of the prime minister and let them loose on the protesters. And what they didn't expect uh, was the reaction of the general public. You know, they caught the thugs and threw them into uh, lakes and burnt buses. And unfortunately, several people also uh, lost their lives. Um, so if there was any confidence left in these people, that just dissipated yesterday. Uh, so now um, we are, like I said at the beginning, in a very precarious situation uh, where that confidence need to be rebuilt. And the only way that confidence can be rebuilt, in my view, is to have a new government. Uh, hopefully, the president uh, would resign uh, because the, la the cry for his uh, resignation has gotten uh, even louder uh, post yesterday. Uh, because otherwise, we are going to go into some crisis. I mean, of course, we are in a huge crisis, unprecedented crisis. And it could even worsen. And I uh, shudder to think what might happen uh, if there is no political solution in the next 24, 48 hours. Uh, Bhavani, how realistic do you think that is? Do you think that the president might resign, especially now that he has these emergency powers and that he's also now given officers the power to detain and question without arrest warrants? Well, I mean, I'm glad you raised this. The powers of the executive presidency is enormous, and this was consolidated under this president, under the 20th Amendment. So this president for weeks have been hearing the calls, or one assumes he heard the calls of the protesters calling for his resignation. A survey we did also showed that 87% wanted the president to resign. Now, that's a huge number if you really think about it, a significant portion, including his own base. And regardless, he's held on to power. Now, I don't see him leaving that easily. And that is the unfortunate situation that him holding on to this office, this all powerful office, is having a huge detriment to this country and its citizens. So I fear that unless there's more pressure brought for, to um, make the president resign, we're going to see much, much more dire times. That said, I just want to say this. The president resigning doesn't mean we are left in a vacuum. The Constitution provides for a, um, a prime minister to be appointed and a president to be appointed by parliament. So there are specific measures provided in the Constitution that can be taken very quickly as soon as the president resigns. So this is the most critical, urgent need right now. Well, let me ask then, if the Rajapaksas are removed, Ganeshan, given the dire state of the economy, you're an economist, the challenges are obviously likely to continue. We could see austerity measures. These could be very painful for many people in Sri Lanka who are already suffering. Even with these economic realities then, do you think we could see discontent continue? So I think that Sri Lanka can eventually come out of this dire situation if we put in place the right policies and we have political will. And one has seen this elsewhere um, in the developing world uh, where countries have come out of such serious situations. So I have a little bit of optimism for Sri Lanka, but we need to do at least three things to try to get this back on track. The first is we need to restructure the foreign debt uh, which is held by pi private creditors, uh, that's the majority of the debt, and also the bilateral creditors, and that includes China and India, 
as well as Japan. And, and that's quite a tricky set of conversations that have to be held. The second thing is we've got to agree on and implement fully an IMF program on macroeconomic stability and debt management. Mm. And that is going to be quite a complex discussion because there are two bits of money that will have to come. There is a, a short bit of money under a rapid financing facility, some $400 million. And then there is uh, uh, something called an enhanced uh, program from the IMF, which is about $3 billion or $1 billion a year, uh, which will have to come and we'll have to show substantial progress in debt restructuring. And that's the tricky bit. And the third thing which government has to do, whoever comes into power, is to put in place a program of structural reforms to deregulate the economy, to green it, and to ensure inclusiveness. And, and that, that, in, that program is, is essential. And very few governments in Sri Lanka's history have actually reformed uh, the economy well. And there are three important elements in that reform. The first, we've got to cut red tape, which is strangling business. Uh, and that's critical. The second is we've got to encourage women's participation in economic activity. Women's participation rates are low, and this is a problem in an aging society. Uh, Ganesh, and finally, I'm sorry. I I do want to bring in Harsha there because what it sounds like you're saying is that wholesale economic change is necessary. But then, Harsha, let me ask you, does wholesale economic change require wholesale political change as you see it? Yes, and I think I agree with uh, uh, what uh, Ganeshan said. But, uh, you know, we need to be able to get these reforms done, but you need to have the political will to do it. And like he said, nobody really had that will previously to do it. And I think this is the best time to get all these structural reforms done. However, uh, we need to ensure that people are cushioned somehow. So I will have to add a fourth point to his three, and that is a very strong social protection system. So we need to be able to, uh, to protect the people who are going to be the worst hit with this reform. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we are thinking about right now, because if we take government in the next uh, few days, uh, that is the first thing uh, we would need to do. And the IMF is fully on board with that plan. Um, and uh, we hope that we will succeed. Uh, Bhavani, I want to ask you something that Harsha alluded to a little bit earlier in our conversation. And uh, taking a step back from all of this, uh, I've seen speculation on part of various different people in Sri Lanka that this is part of a conversation that could shape a country. Do you think that the protests that we've seen, the process that we're in now, is this part of nation building? Definitely. I, I believe we have this um, unique opportunity and I think that's a very important thing to remember. You know, while we've seen the violence of the last 24 hours, the last few weeks showed that citizens have come out peacefully, united. There's been some issues, but I mean, recognizing that there's a lot to do, but people can be united in building this country. And there's also recognition that there needs to be structural reforms brought in that changes the structure of this country. So one of the key reforms that people are now coming behind is the abolishing the executive presidency. Now, if things like that, the devolution of power, reconciliation, economic justice, all of that can come together, we have this uh, unique opportunity to really push this country forward and bring in stability and economic growth. But, you know, these are long-term plans. I think immediately what we need is to have a government that gives people the confidence that this is possible and that's the problem right now. Well, it is a very tricky situation for Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for joining us to discuss what's happening on the ground now. We'll be watching it very closely here on Al Jazeera. Thank you to all of our guests, Harsha De Silva, Ganeshan Wignaraja and Bhavani Fonseca. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And do remember, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.